Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk episode, uh, oh, what is it? 742, recording today live on, uh, oh dear, January the 11th, 2023. I'm nearly there. Second show of the year. So I, I, you probably detect from my voice, I've got a little bit of, I'm trying, I've still got a cold, which I just can't quite shake off and I sort of feel great. And then I don't feel great. And I'm just having a, I'm having a bit of a moment, uh, slightly cloudy headed, but it's, I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Everything's going to be all right. Uh, anyway, I want to say thank you very much to everybody for joining us. We've got all of the folks in the IRC and the YouTube chats uh, where you can watch us because we're streaming live to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and that's it. But Discord, you can bring in. If you want to join us on Discord, actually, I haven't been plugging this much. I want to try and give it a bit more love. We've got our own Discord server. Head over to bit.ly slash Sonic Discord. You can join it there. And of course, if you're a Patreon supporter, you get access to the other channels there. In fact, this is the point at which I should probably press the Patreon button because I did record a new ad this time because it was all a bit behind the scenes and a bit behind the times. But uh, before I do that, I just want to mention uh, this is a podcast to do with electronic music and music production in general, studios, live technology, streaming, all that kind of stuff. So uh, please sit back for the next hour or so, uh, brought to you by our very good friends and sponsors, um, Baby Audio and also Isotope. But first, I'd like to have a go at plugging patreon and why you should support us on patreon why not consider joining us on patreon for the price of a cup of coffee you get ad free versions of everything that we do there's also lots of exclusive video a recent one is uh, another 30 minutes of osmo's demo that we shot with gaz and christoph and there's patches there's sample downloads and there's also all the pre-show sonic talk stuff that we don't post anywhere else uh, if you want to join us before the end of the show and you pick our upper tier which is still only a couple of cups of, cups of coffee a month you'll get your name over the end credits thanks very much for watching Yes, so uh, there we go. I recorded a new one, but I, I, I must get into the habit of that. Um, so uh, let's get on to our guests, uh, because we have guests. Uh, there, uh, There is news, I believe, as well. So it's oh, all's good. It's fantastic. We'll start over there in uh, uh, London, where uh, Yoad is in Anivo Sound, his studio, which is uh, in a lovely part of London, which is crammed to the brim full of things that uh, viewers of our show will uh, no doubt be hankering after. Yoad, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. Good to be back. Lovely to have you. It's been so, a while, uh, you're, I feel. You, it, it does feel like a little while, actually. You so um, yeah. you're, Are you in the middle of a mix at the moment, or are you just kind of still on uh, holiday break? No, no. I'm, uh, I had a very short break, uh, although very nice as well. But, um, yeah, I'm actually working, like I mentioned be, uh, to you before, I'm working on a production in Dolby Atmos, so do, doing everything um, in Dolby Atmos from the start, uh, like ah, creating okay. in Dolby Atmos, which is very, very interesting. It has a lot of technical uh, kind of angles to to tackle. Uh, <coughs> yeah, but it's really cool. I'm really enjoying it, and it's all yeah. It's all here. I don't even need to do anything to go back to the mix. Uh, it's, oh, nice. I hit playing and it's there, you know, so, yeah. That, I'm, cu I'm curious, actually. So how does that work? Because obviously the, 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 the Atmos engine for playing stuff in real time through it, sort of virtual instruments things, do you have a kind of, do you have a, 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 a um, a thing where you you're you you monitor in non Dolby Atmos for the recording part and then flip to the mix, or do you actually record everything through the Dolby Atmos experience? So yeah, that's that's the million dollar question, really, because um, um, the the Dolby Atmos when you when you go through the render, it adds its own its own latency, but also it wants you to to be on uh, five hundred and qu and uh, and twelve K. Uh, buffer size so there's quite a bit of latency there are a few ways to to tackle it obviously you can't play through it uh, right. because it's too much latency but there are different tricks you can apply so you can um, kind of have a negative delay on the on the backing track so that when you play you will monitor yourself through a different matrix, albeit because you have to ah, move your okay. plane or your signal, and and then it will match the recording when you play it back. There's that. There's another way of um, 
of tricking some plugins, uh, like logic plugins. Um, there's uh, the e e-verb or whatever it's called, um, and the gate. They can report logic of uh, latency, which you don't necessarily have to go through, which means that it will push everything else back. So like the, oh, the, the okay. gate, it has a look ahead, which basically puts the plugin back in time, if you will, by right. delaying all the other tracks. And so you, you, there are a few tricks that, uh, and it's quite like a, it. quite an exploration. <laughs> an exploration <because laughs> sounds like a different. sounds like a mind blowing experience. Sounds like the sort of thing that you're yeah, just kind of like, entering like into the, the world of time of, travel. I like <laughs> yeah, I like those things. Um, you know, so that that it's 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 tricky, but once you figure out the way of doing it, and it and it varies because if you play a guitar, it's one thing. Um, you don't necessarily have to have it kind of moving or anything, so you can place it. So you need a different matrix, Dolby or seven one four matrix for monitoring. It's uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's something new and it's exciting. And uh, you know, everything has become so easy and so sort of available and instant and all that that it reminds me of the days of like syncing to 24 track uh, tape machines or three um and offsetting and copying courses from here you know right, all okay. that that kind of stuff i love it i love it and i i i you well, I, I'm I'm glad you're happy. I mean, I think for many of us, it's probably just a a, a, a bit too much extra. But um, I know, uh, Gaz Williams. I, we also have Gaz here as well. Are, are you? Have you? Did you go five one in your? Have you got five one, or are you just sticking no. to good old stereo and sub? I was having a conversation with a uh, chat conversation with uh, my good friend Peter Chilvers, who's just mixed the new Brian Eno and Roger Eno live from the Acropolis album, which I think is just coming out. Uh, and which he did a, a an Atmos mix for, and that was the first Atmos mix he did. And uh, he had some interesting uh, uh, he he shared some interesting thoughts with me um, that because he didn't have uh, an Atmos system at home, he was monitoring with headphones on. And I think this was before Logic. Uh, he's a Logic user, and before Logic had that integrated, but he was kind of getting a good idea of where everything should be. I mean, it's like Brian, he was working from Brian's stereo mix, and but just trying to sort of right. work out the kind of placement of it. But he, he said that what he'd sort of developed in his headphone world translated really well to actually moving that across onto the, uh, onto Atmos. And I wondered whether that was something, yeah, you know, because when I've tried to do that with 5.1, it's, I don't know, maybe it just wasn't the idea of being, you know, I think with 5.1, we were trying to think we could position things in that 3D space. But I think obviously Atmos is a bigger step to that. I was wondering if Yoad could uh, sort of comment on that. How have you found working with Atmos on headphones to Atmos? How how much, mm -hmm. how similar is that? Um, so the translation from the kind of experience you get listening to the speakers in a kind of correct and proper environment is is an interesting one um i think that um uh, it, well it's complicated and we don't have a lot of time so i'm you know because i can i can speak for about it for three hours right now um, <laughs> So, so I don't, I don't even know where to start. But um, the thing is that um, the the binaural mix down that Dolby or Apple provide. So Apple within Logic, you can switch between the two when you work in the integrated sort of way. I work with, although I I use Logic, but I work with the Dolby Atmos uh, renderer, and I use its decoder. Uh, for the for the binaural um, and it's different it's a different experience and once you get the balance between the Dolby Atmos from the speakers the rendered binaural signal 
and which I think is really crucial here, the stereo headphones mix. So I set up in, in SoundGrid um, with the push of a button, I can, I can change between the main speakers, <coughs> the headphones, all, although I have to put them on my head, you know, so it's not like a proper AB, but still. And, and, uh, and on the headphones, I can flick between the stereo and the binaural signal. Right. So these three anchors, because I have to have the stereo headphones mix because that's what I know. I'm used to, to listening to stereo stuff on my headphones all my life. So I know that very well. Listening just to the binaural is, is tricky. And, uh, and flicking between the three is the, the, the secret because you discover things, especially with the, the placement of the sub and, and things like that, that you wouldn't necessarily do on a stereo mix for headphones, but you, you could do on, and those things become very clear and obvious. So it, it really helps. It's like anchors. For, for so right. so because in you know it, in theory everything is possible you can do whatever you want but it has to ninety nine percent of of people listen to music on headphones and I would say that ninety nine point something percent of those people listen to to stereo mixes on the headphones and only very few listen to binaural mixes um, so. It has to, to be compatible if you don't want to do the whole mix again. So the, the, again, I can talk about it for a long time, but there's a, you know, different methods of whether you do the stereo mix first and then you use the stems to do the Dolby Atmos mix or you start with the Dolby Atmos mix and then you fold it down to stereo. So there are different approaches, and, uh, um, but I'll stop now. <laughs> right yeah it's complicated i mean i i the the only I, i'll just throw mine in is the only thing that i did is i did a quick look i did a sort of some panning tests with the but for the binaural mixes just sort of go so what's actually happening and i could perceive that the what the engine the, the atmos um binaural mix down engine or whatever it may be in there it's the thing that's adding all that weird psychoacoustic stuff with the sort of reflections so you get a sense of something the direction it's coming in and it's it's really subtle, but it, it's it's mm. that's what those are the things that tell us where that what directions things are in. But it's quite an interesting thing. If you get a chance, it's worth just taking a really simple kind of pulsed staccato synth and just panning it around the, and moving it up and down in the space and just just sort of understanding what it's doing. And you start to get a much clearer idea of what a very simple sound source is having done to it to kind of give you the sense of where it is in 3D space rather than just in 2D space, if that makes any sense. But yes, I take your point. It's a, it's a topic that we could probably go on for ages about, and uh, I'm sure many of our listeners would be interested, but we feel duty-bound to move on to other pastures while we're here, I think, as well. But thank you very much, Gaz, uh, for, and, and uh, Yoad for that. Right, um, what have we got? Uh, oh, I'm going into topics mode, aren't I? So I suppose, oh yeah, here we go. Let's get into something fun. This is kind of interesting. So let's start with, uh, with a bit of this. Ha. This is the Coco Nicolazzi drone box. He's done a load of uh, sort of physical, sculptural, and electroacoustic, mechanical stuff. This is stepper motors in a sound box. But what he does is also add additional resonators on top of the stepper motors. This is a four voice um, MIDI controlled thing. So he's got some clever stuff going on, presumably some sort of Raspberry Pi type thing. And it's quite similar to what the Game Changer Audio thing does, but but quite different as well. And very sort of wooden and boxy, because that's the thing is. I don't know, I, I know this isn't, you know, he doesn't make them commercially. There's absolutely no way you could buy this. I mean, I expect you could probably commission him to do something for you. You know, it's one of those topics that I occasionally do, which is like the uh, man makes um, Wells Cathedral out of matchsticks, you know, project. It's that sort of thing, isn't it? You know, I don't know. I suspect, I mean, Gaz, wouldn't you just love to have one of these on a shelf somewhere uh, and be able to play it and make uh, it? Wouldn't it be a lovely uh, thing, right? Yeah, and when you hear the different 
resonant qualities on that video because it's clearly mic'd up so you are hearing what's going on uh, i think it's really fascinating that uh that pine cone sounds like a pine cone yeah some it kind of it, it really connects it looks I like yeah it, it mentions that like you know the different things uh, the different resonators do different things but like the egg doesn't actually do anything so what you hear when you, the egg is actually just what the motor's doing because um, mm. i was kind of wondering how resonant an egg would actually be uh i suppose hard boiled um, or uh, yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, but i think the organic nature of it uh, the sound is really fascinating you know this idea where you can take essentially this digital technology to to create this analog sound uh i wonder just how much you know how much more interesting things there are along those lines i mean resonances are are lots of fun to play with um i've got the uh, elements module um or a clone of unfortunately uh, of the mutable instruments um which is like a physical modeling that goes into like a resonant uh kind of it, um, section which is more or less the same as the uh the module uh rings um mm. but i mentioned that though just because that one gives you various uh acoustic spaces that you can kind of feed the sound into a resonant and then crank the resonance up um and i think it's such a intrinsic part of music resonance you know that, that resonant frequencies um so I'm curious now. I mean, obviously, Game Changer Audio bringing out the Motor Synth. I think the Motor Synth Two. I, I haven't tried the Motor Synth Two. I, I have played the Motor Synth One, which is a lot of fun, but, but it's a very kind of noisy thing. <laughs> I think the, yeah. the the Two is a bit more refined. Um, but I would be interested to see if there are more developments. There's a little Weng. What's it called? The uh, the Mankey or something? The, the little resonance. Yes, uh, that looks really good. Yeah, that looks really nice. Actually, uh, sold out everywhere that, that, that i can't remember what it's called but yes i know the one you mean i, I i'm curious the thing the thing about this though and i think this is a, a big part of it a part of what you think you're hearing you're getting a lot of visual cues from you know i saw the the, the yeah. initial image and there's a picture of a paper cup of one you go i bet i know what that's going to sound like and so the <laughs> visual cues that you get from it are also yeah. a big part of it i think as well which yeah. is interesting I don't know. I, I loved it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's the sort of thing. I mean, do you have uh, whimsical musical oddities lying around the studio and sort of mechanical sculptures and stuff to, to kind of uh, tinker, tickle the brain, or are you kind of very much more well? I have guitars. You know, practical. That's kind impractical. Of, yes, that, I suppose that's that kind of answer. Is that definition, isn't it? Doesn't it? Um, I think I like this. I mean, it it reminds me. It looks like a kind of fifties kitchen breakfast gizmo, you know, um, <laughs> sort of thing. But, uh, and it's really, really cool. I suspect that what we're hearing is the resonance of the box. I yeah. don't know if, how much significant is, you know, a piece of paper or, uh, you know, um, would be on that. Well, I there think was a difference. There was a difference when they when he just had the little paper flag at the beginning and then put the pine cone on. There was a difference in it. It did certainly seem to sound different. But didn't he? Wasn't he playing lower with the pine cone? Uh, so well, it it has so. more kind of uh, harmonics tell. and stuff. Um, I don't know, but it's it's really cool. It's very cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we like. We like. I think the more of these things, please. And I think uh, I, one thing that I did find interesting is like a stepper motors, you know, because we're mm. I've I've looked into the idea of stepper motors using stepper motors here for robotics and stuff, and it's like I would never use it. I mean, they just sound ridiculously noisy. Why would you use anything that because yeah. they whine and they do sing stepper motors when you hear, so they they can be incredibly loud, which is obviously a byproduct rather than maybe a designed in it's just the way it goes but anyway i just thought it was fun we should have that in there i, I must remember to do the ads this week because i was really amiss and i didn't do one until the last week so i'm going to do one now uh with uh, let's go with um baby audio and uh, dom can do his beautiful voice over isotopes ozone 10 is the future of mastering 
the new version includes the master assistant, which matches your master to any reference file. The advanced version includes a stabilizer module, adding mixed clarity with an intelligent and adaptive mastering EQ, and an impact module, which enhances the rhythm by controlling micro dynamics. Don't forget, you can use the code SONIC10, that's SONIC10, at isotope.com forward slash SONIC TALK to save an additional 10% of any one-off software purchase. That's SONIC10 at isotope.com forward slash SONIC TALK. And of course, uh, don't forget, you can head over to that uh, you, uh, um URL and there's a special landing page and like you will get your deal there. We have actually, we've got a little piece of real estate in the the mega isotope. Uh, well, I suppose they're, they're a huge conglomerate now because they're all, uh, I can't forget the name of the, the umbrella company, but it's nice to, we've got a tie. I wonder if that means we get shares just by, if I, if I could get a lawyer to actually sort of uh, just somehow argue the case for that. I, I, I very much doubt it. Anyway, but thank Wait, you very much to their... Who's, who, who is that parent company then? It's all, lot of, is it Native Instruments as well, isn't it? Yeah, I can't remember. And uh, and also uh, Fruity Loops, I believe, is part of it as well. I think so, yeah. Yeah, so it's a big, big old, big old chunk of stuff. <coughs> coffee really um, uh, okay so let's have a look oh yeah look we've got to do this i mean this is you know very hot topic at the moment and uh you know and gaz is clo one close to your heart i'd imagine as well so uh christoph came in and uh showed us the osmos or showed gaz the osmos uh, and we had a good play and a good dig around with it and uh, since then uh, lots of people have been getting them there's been a lot of videos out of people sort of checking their uh, um, checking all their uh, um, sounds and whatnot, and this is a good, healthy 55 minute video with an extra 30 minutes on Patreon. If those are interested, uh, that's the sort of extras you get there. But, um, lovely piece, uh, obviously, you know, we can talk about you know that a little bit what's really interesting you know it's be finally become a thing you know it, it's it, it's official it's out there and they sort of relaunched they've they've supplied the stuff to the kickstarters that's all started to go out i don't think it's gone to america supporters yet because it has to go in a container and that just takes a bit longer but the point is it's a thing and it's going to be a thing and they've taken pre-orders again for the next batch which will be available in april and they've they've taken those at the price of 17.99 euros which i th i again i think is a very uh, competitive a very keen price for something this cutting edge uh, and uh, but they've sold out of the ones you can buy direct from them and now you have to buy them directly from the um, the retailers they've got partners everywhere but I, I I don't know I feel like we might be on the verge of something quite um, quite sort of uh, big here something that's really going to change the way that people expect to play things I mean I know we're hearing an awful lot of uh, kind of uh, slightly sort of off off piece non-western scale playing from fantastic musicians like there's some really good stuff from the, the indian community there which and the playing was just astonishing i'm just wondering how applicable this is going to be to everybody else i'll come back to you guys because i know you had first hand uh um knowledge of it i don't know whether or not you had you've you've been following the progress of this i know a lot of our panelists have been really keen I, you may have already ordered one i don't know but uh, do you think this is going to change things do you feel that there's going to be a, a shift because something like this can really change, can actually almost change the nature of the kind of music that we hear because we're hearing a sound, we're hearing technology that allows us to express in a, quite a different way. And it hasn't happened for a while, I don't think. Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> and I think it's, it, it, makes it, it makes it kind of, it's more solid than the, the continuum. The continuum kind of does that as well in a way um yeah. same sign but here yeah. you have proper yeah but here you have proper keys so you can play presumably like a normal keyboard i i wonder what the the, the feel of it like the the weighting of it's on, quite, on the keys it's and, quite firm it's quite firm i would say so i i guess you need it to be because if you you know if you want to control it properly, you, it has to have some kind of resistance, resistance. in all axes. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's, um, it's really cool. I don't know what about it for me because I'm not a pianist. Um, I feel like I, I'm more expressive on a, 
on on mini keys. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but mm. but I just have them in front of me for years now, and I'm kind of used to to that and to doing like little. Um, if I if I need to play like proper chords or something like that, I will go to the to the real keyboard, real. But um, I, I I wonder if the the planning on doing something like that on a, on a slightly smaller scale, because I do, yeah, I don't know. If, if it's no. like an expressive, I see it at like an expressive sort of lead and and stuff where you don't necessarily need to play the the entire os. O- o- orchestra kind of arrangement for, for my perspective, because I play overdubs, <coughs> you know what I mean? I play this yeah. and then I play yeah, that yeah. and I don't do like live sort of performance, keyboard yeah. performances. Um, so, so for me, it's a little bit, the, the, the size of the keys and stuff, it's a little bit, or, and the whole thing is a little bit intimidating. I have to say, um, right, something, okay. At the same time, something like the Hydrosynth, the Explorer, which has many keys and uh, polyphonic aftertouch and all that, obviously it doesn't have the the whole shebang. But um, this, I don't feel like very confident about that. You know, so it, it, yeah, it's all it's about. Not, it's, it's, uh, the sen- it, it's really, unless you put your hand on one, it's really hard to describe how sensitive and responsive it is. And I think that's the key thing. Yes, the keyboard is quite firm, but you don't have to hit it very hard. You don't have to press very hard. You can, but you don't have to. You can be very progressive with things. And mm-hmm. I think where, I, I take your point, you know, a lot of the party pieces are people playing beautifully rehearsed and, and, and things that would take a little while. But also, by the same token, there are a few examples, and I think we covered them in previous episodes, where it's literally two fingers, and it's just a question of how you're interacting between those two fingers, and the perform- the level of expression you can get from that is also quite astonishing. I think it's an interesting And, and thing, that yeah. is something that is more up my street and 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 therefore and that's why i have well, you can't fit it on your knee <laughs> yeah that's You've why that's Harkin, why yeah, i that's... have the continue meaning because it gives me that kind of one voice or duophonic or you know kind of paraphonic two voice thing on this which has the same engine the the egan matrix yes. which is amazing uh, so it, it presumably has the same presets as uh, the i'm not sure maybe if it's i don't the same. I, I don't I, th- I suspect they'd be different because there's a different there are different control different parameters for the actual yeah i think not I quite think so. because the way it's, it's designed because the, of the matrix element of it you still have the the x y and z you know so you still have the same plane so um but this one, I use it okay, occasionally for stuff that I can't do with anything else. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it makes sense to access to the Egan Matrix. I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, we'll get on to you in a sec, guys. The one thing that I'm wondering about is that everybody says the Egan Matrix is, is really quite impenetrable to program. You know, it doesn't have a slick UI. It doesn't have, and I wonder by bringing it, more into mainstream because there are going to be a lot more people exposed to that as a sound engine we might see some more development or some uh, some people writing a more accessible front end to that so we see more sounds and it, it kind of then filters through to other stuff i don't know what do you think then guys um well so we were talking about this on the phone yesterday about the osmos yeah. and uh, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, that you that that you think that the, that it sounds a bit cold? Would you say that's fair? Or like yes, I think so. I, 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 it's really interesting because the expression is obviously amazingly organic and really mm. wa- warm in in a in, in a sort of color sense, I suppose. Yes, but I found fa- I felt that some of the sounds, yeah, the, some of the sounds just didn't feel, you know, I right. suppose very analog, which is they're not, I- you know. Which they're not, which is a good point. But after we spoke, I went to my friend Simon Preston's house, and he's a lucky uh, owner of uh, Osmos. So I got to spend a, a bit of time with it last night. And um, and I was thinking about what you said, and uh, the EQ is great. You, can, you know, you go into the EQ, and 
it uses, um, I think there might be some different versions of EQ, but it certainly, it gives you the tilt. It gives you like a tilt EQ. Um, right. And I just, I just, I just did the tilt. And Simon was, uh, my friend Simon was saying a similar thing. He thought it was a quite digital, quite, you know. But then as soon as we did that tilt and we set the frequency of the tilt point, it sounded really, it was a really lovely sounding EQ. It brought out a really nice, rich, low end to it and uh, and smoothed, oh, smoothed off the top. And, and it's like, well, this now sounds like an analog. Uh, this sounds very analog now. So I think, I just thought that was quite interesting, just following up on that conversation that we had. And, yeah, and the yeah. fact that it's super quick to, uh, to adjust. Yeah. And also, I, I was having a little dive around what you can do we do cover this in the video the sonic video there but have a little dive around with the range of sound m manipulation that you've got on the osmos because you don't have access to the engine from the osmos but you do have access to some macros which have some have some effect um and there's some really nice things you can do. So even any every sound, and this is one of the things that you, you really have to play in Osmos to fully experience, is that every single preset is worth exploring. Typically, we just page through presets looking for something. But yeah, every there's more. It's more than just pressing a note down, isn't it? Yeah, that everyone that, is almost like an instrument in its own right. From what what I heard, yeah, exactly. And then that leads you into that control panel and what you can do there to each sound and uh you know it's only a small range of parameters but they're quite nice and they're quite and, it mu and it's very kind of musically focused what they mm. do um so this is not a sound designer's keyboard at all you don't you, unless you want to get into the into the egan matrix and then it is and, ap, ap, and then it absolutely is but um and I think managing that expectation for people, I think, is quite an important thing because typically we've been looking for very much a different thing with synths is full access to the synth engine on board. So, yeah, I agree. It's 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 it's, yeah. it's that's what I was thinking. It does feel like a sort of paradigm shift to a degree, and I mm. wonder how much it may influence. And also because uh, it seems very very well suited to non-Western scales, um, because of those kind of microtonal bending and that that, that uh, uh, pressure sensitive mm. uh, portamento, which is a lovely performative uh, yeah. um, thing as well. I'm just wondering whether will. It will it will bring more of this into the more mainstream music that we listen to, which is kind of an interesting. It could be. I mean, I may be over grandiosing it. You know, I'm, I'm sure I am a bit, but it does feel. It, it's hard to explain what it's like to be in the room with one and play one. I mean, you can watch people all day do it. I mean, it's really interesting. Tim Shoebridge did his video and, you know, he obviously, you know, hasn't learned how to play it in the same way that Christoph has been for years and years. So you watch Christoph playing it and other people who are really, really well, really well, and you just think, ooh, and then you watch Tim sort of noodle around and it's like, no, that doesn't, that technique doesn't quite work. You, there is definitely, you need to adapt to be able to get the most from it again. So I wonder how yes. many, you know, it's a bit like an Osmos is not just for Christmas kind of thing, isn't it, almost? So my friend Simon was asking me, though, he was going, how do I record it MIDI, though? He was really sort of wanting to get, and, and I was going, just don't bother about the MIDI yeah. for now. Just record takes and edit takes, you know, and edit audio, edit it as audio. And that was yeah. what Chris... Uh, who's in Christopher, who was demonstrating it in the video? He that was his advice as well. I mean, you, you can absolutely edit it, but you're generating such a lot of information, such a lot of data streams, each finger, everything. There's, that no, it's, you there's know. nothing that, can, and uh, yeah, Johan, I mean, this thing, I know you'd be horrified at the thought of this to a degree. You know, you, you can MIDI it, but you can't. Uh, what door can handle that a level of data because it works at a much higher resolution even than MPE. You know, it's got an incredibly everything is just sort of crazy amounts of uh, resolution to, to interface directly with the the heart of the egan metrics rather than anything else i mean you can play a, i'm really curious to see how you can map it to to something like the hydrosynth and you know maybe pigments four or you know i'm really curious to see how it plays with those sort of things or that's, you know any other synths that's, that handle that's, it. yeah exactly that's that's the key but i think that 
they have like each one of those instruments is um, kind of tailored to the hardware. So if you try to do stuff, sending stuff to the Egan matrix engine, which is on the continuum mini from the hydro synth, it doesn't <laughs> straight out of the box. It doesn't translate really in a, in a kind of usable yeah. way. So it feels right. a little bit awkward and, um, I think there shouldn't be a problem to record the media information. It's not that much. I mean, uh, if you, if you think of, of how much an audio track takes in terms of, of how many bits are actually going to memory, I don't think it's, uh, it's that much, especially if you're talking about high sample rates and, uh, and kind of interleaved files and things like that. Um, but editing it would be a nightmare would would be an absolute <laughs> nightmare because the the voices are are not fixed you know so you have the the 16 channels and the voice each time you play a voice on mpe it will appear the control data will appear on a different channel Right, so, so it's, yeah, it's just uh, Ryan Robin, yeah. So you have to kind of trace it, and uh, and and then you have all the layers of uh, like the X, Y, Z for each one. So it's uh, it's yeah. I think that what Gaz uh, suggested. Probably, yeah, probably just that, as that, just as quick to do, do. The, do the take again and get it right, <laughs> rather than trying yeah, to. Yeah, that that, that's, right, that's yeah, what I do. That's what I use the continuum minute for. If I have something that requires like a vibe or something. It could be a percussive thing or kind of, um, you know, um, or whatever. And I just go through the presets and, and I, while I'm recording and I do like a pass or two, and then I'll find like a couple of useful things, useful elements there and use them. It's interesting, you know, I, just the fact that you've brought my attention to the Harkin Mini uh, Continuum Mini has made me kind of quite interested in that, whereas previous to this, I wouldn't have done. And I think that's what I'm saying, that almost the Osmos has made the, yeah, the Egan right. Matrix a kind of like, oh, actually, maybe I should look at that. So I, I, I'm a smart move to partnership because hopefully it will mean everybody sells more uh, and people have a more of an interest into a high expressive instrument. So I'm, I might have to try that out just it, out of curiosity, but... Yeah, the the Egan Matrix also. I don't know if it's available yet, but coming out as a Euro rack module, it might be out. Um, we covered it in uh, Super Booth. So making that synth engine open to the world of modular, you know, I think you'd mm. have to really roll your sleeves up, you know, if you want to take on that. But uh, I think that's quite interesting for that platform, you know, it, to encourage more development. I, yeah, more. I just get a sense that there's a breed of sound designers and patch designers that are apart from the rest of the world who can who can actually <laughs> program sounds in the Eager Matrix. The sort of yeah. like the Mike Bristow DX7 school of programming. They just mm. you have to have a or you have to have sort of genius level kind of abstraction capabilities to be able to come up with the stuff. But uh, it's they, funny. You know, that I don't know. Ed, Ed Egan and um, Lifold Harkin. You know, having met them a few times at Superbooth, um, are really playful people, aren't they? Really sort mm. of got this energy about them, which I think is quite interesting because, uh, yeah, you know, both of them working, striving for this, and now with Expressive E as well, this uh, uh, real kind of play playful kind of approach yeah uh, it's like a life's work isn't it i mean it's now finally yeah. coming to fruition mm -hmm. in a way you know, so. yes really and remember at super booth we got to hear the osmos through the levoir de luthier the speaking about resonators that um so one of the most curious things i think about the uh about the osmos is that it does have these mounting holes which were designed to mount one of those acoustic resonating chambers mm. directly onto it and it was quite interesting hearing the osmos coming out through that uh oh yeah i can imagine certainly didn't sound digital through that did it um <laughs> yeah. no 
Yeah. I just got to. Uh, I'm sorry. So, I, I, I do beg your pardon. Failed Museo has corrected me. It's Dave Bristow, not Mike Bristow. Uh, I nearly said Eric Bristow, which would have been even <laughs> even more crass of me. But uh, he was a darts player, famous darts player. Anyway, um, we should probably move on. Um, uh, um, oops. Oh gosh, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons again. I'm I'm, I'm practicing too hard. So uh, we should probably move on. And I do need to just uh, have a word from my friends over at Baby Audio as well. So uh, we'll just hear Dom's lovely voice once again. Baby Audio make creative effects plugins designed to add colour and depth to your mixes. They won Plugin of the Year 2021 in Future Music and Computer Music Magazine, and they were nominated for the SOS Awards two years in a row. Crystalline is an algorithmic reverb plugin inspired by classic 20th century studio reverbs, but offering higher fidelity thanks to 21st century computing power. A reverb No, oh, is it frozen? I do uh, beg your pardon. What's a plug-in with a variety of creative features, such as the ability to tempo sync, pre-delay, and reverb decay times. You can get 15% off when checking out with the code ST15. Do apologise for that break in transmission. Not quite sure what happened there. It's just one of those technical things, that's all I can say. Uh, let's see. Well, gosh, I don't really know where to go next. I know, Gaz, you're very keen on uh, the Oliver Pren uh, topic. So I think, you know, as yeah. as I invited you on at the last minute, and we again, you were talking about this, I feel we should, um, just purely because um, I, I would, it would be cruel of me. Okay, so here's, uh, yeah, another topic. Hi, my name is Oliver Pring. Join me on this little walk in the forest this morning in the early springtime, and we will talk about improvised music. Furthermore, we will talk about how we can make a living and have a free and open-minded relationship with music. There's quite a long uh, monologue. I mean, it's one of many videos that Oliver does. Uh, he's actually, uh, his day job, I think he drives a bus. Uh, I'm not sure. But he's yeah. also a really good teacher. His videos, uh, if you check out Oliver Pren on uh, YouTube, there's some really good stuff that explains a lot. And, and, and Gaz, you were mentioning to me that uh, you've really found it resonate. You know, you, you could learn from him quite easily. I funny, I'm listening to that and it, re it almost feels like a fast show sketch to me. It really is sort of, there's something slightly comedic yeah. about it. I mean, he's... I, he can tell he's a lovely guy, uh, but it just I, I find it hard to take seriously for some reason. But I know that he does some really good videos on other stuff. So I know because yeah. we spoke yesterday um, and you were saying, you know, you'd not heard of him before. And I'd actually, you know, just because we put it in the topic list that, that it, oh, and it, he really works for you. Yeah, they, you know, my music theory knowledge is OK. It's I mean, I, I did my grade five. I could have gone further with it. You know, I got some music theory, but there's gaps, you know, and um, and I've listened to a lot of crazy technical music over the years. There's obviously loads of beautiful classical music and stuff that's way outside of my own technical abilities, you know, to compose and to understand and, and harmony, you know, advanced harmony. Um, building harmony onto harmony, extended mm. super harmony, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it often feels quite academic when you want to try and go a little bit deeper. And with good reason, it does get quite complicated as soon as you start to get, you know, the deeper you're into it. What makes this Oliver Pren guy? He's Danish, I believe. And yeah, but and he's a bus driver. <laughs> um, it, what makes those videos really good is that he kind of unlocks some really deeper music theory in ways that is probably the most accessible I've ever seen, um, specifically relating to the piano. Now, I'm a pretty hopeless keyboard player. I can, you know, bumble my way through things. Uh, but I typically get stuck in a key. You know, anyone who's watched any of my videos will probably know which key that is. But get stuck in a key and find it, I don't know, find it hard to know how to transition from one key into another key. When I compose and like with my bass and stuff, I, I can do a certain amount of that instinctively. But what he it goes to explain in some of the videos, the one about modes I thought was really interesting was how you can open up as you move as you as you're playing up, how you can 
modify and mutate the scales as you go up and how you can mutate and modify the scales as you go down and whether you, and he's talking about cl- uh, grips like sort of like if you do like a pentatonic grip so just like a a certain you know uh, mm. like pentatonic scale but you know when if you're playing and you're moving it up and you go up in the cycle of fifths and then how you can just modify the modes as you go up to be either brighter or darker or when you go down to be brighter or darker oh i tell you what it was like a light i had a light bulb moment a light when bulb. he was I, that. It I suppose really the thing was. i was going to come to I, I didn't want to sorry i didn't want to interrupt you too much there but i think the thing was is like you know we all many of us you know maybe had our musical chops you know many years ago and haven't really kind of spent any time with it and i suppose my question was this is you know this high has a certain approach to teaching it might not be for everybody but you know what do you do when you need to top up your theory and it sounds like for you guys you found someone who can mm-hmm. really help you out there i wonder whether or not uh, um you know because you've been a, a a guitar player for many years you know, i mean do you find that you're because you you obviously read up a lot on the plugins you develop for waves you know you you you, you probably learn an awful lot about the physics and the kind of that side of things. Do you do the same thing for music theory or do you sort of, have you, do you think um, in a sort of st- I, I don't really, I have a, you know, quite a good foundation. Um, like you said, from many years ago and I've been working in music. So, uh, um, so, you know, as a session musician, producer, guitarist, I'm, um, I'm I'm quite uh, confident, but uh, and I haven't watched uh, his his educational videos. Although Gaz just made it kind of uh, interesting uh, to to explore, so I will I will give it a go, and uh, and it's nice to even refresh stuff that you that you know, but to, to get a, a different perspective. What I did come across is the, the, this intro video. Um, which is like about 20 minutes long, uh, just uh, last week, I think, and I watched it all, and it was quite, it was, um, you know, I think that for, for, for people who are starting their way, um, it could be very, it, it's very inspirational. For me, I found a lot of uh, points that I could uh, identify with. Um, and so uh yeah so it was nice to see and it seems like a really nice um i yeah. see no, your point I, about, I, uh, the, about the fast show and all that but if you kind of <laughs> if you kind of get over it then it's it's really cool you know it's cool in yeah, an yeah. uncool way which uh which i like can i just say it is inter- uh, yes go right, guys you. yeah after you no no go I put the third up. <laughs> you are holding the talking stick. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, like, when you use pitch quantizers on modular, I won't speak about this modular too much here, but when you're using pitch quantizers, then you will kind of lock it into uh, a diatonic scale, as in, like, C major or, or whatever. And to mo- to kind of then create pitch uh, to create key changes in a meaningful way you can by sending a very slow square wave into the root note or whatever tune the distance between and, and find a nice key shift um and some of the more sophisticated modules will let you via cv actually change the scale as well um so my interest i think really that's kind of why these videos even though he's talking about it from a piano point of view i'm trying to then interpret that and try and work out how i could incorporate some of those ideas as kind of control voltage messages to to make some of that movement happen you know uh so so yeah i just wanted to say that yeah, no, that's fair enough. Anyway, I, I mean, it was really just more of a kind of exploration because I know many of us don't. And, uh, and it was I, I just happened to see a video the other day where uh, it was George Harrison just sort of talking about Ringo and saying, you know, he doesn't practice, he probably hasn't practiced for years, but he can just do what he does. And I'm the same. He said, I could probably be a much better guitarist than I am. I just don't practice. I pick my guitar up and I do what I do. And for them, they were fortunate that their 
their instincts created the sound of the group. You know, for many of us, we just get stuck in a rut and sometimes, you know, it's hard to see how you might get out of there. But And the notion of practising regularly kind of might make it seem more like a chore. But, uh, you know, sometimes you come across educators that can really kind of inspire you to try stuff. And if you're looking for something, uh, check out Oliver Prone because he may well be provide that little additional spark. I suppose that's all I was trying to do. And it's almost more, more of a public service thing. But uh, um, I think maybe what we could do is... Um, Let's have a look. I'm just. I think we maybe what we'll do is we'll get on to a bit of uh, questions because I know they've been mounting up a little bit, and I would. Uh, I think the uh, this this kind of maybe ties in with the question that came uh, a little bit earlier, and this is from uh, David Songe or Singe. I, um, do you think the popularity of poor quality listening devices like uh, phones and earbuds has an impact on the way people approach production, mixing and even arrangement. And I know we've spoken about this a little bit before. Uh, yeah, Adam, you kind of touched on this a little bit by setting up these the idea of uh, unique listening environments for the, um, the Atmos. Do you think that's the case? I mean, you know, do you th I think it's a very valid point. Um, I would say, I would say this, I mean, it is the case for the hi-hat, it's not the case for the 808. Like, right. you know, if, if <laughs> this was, you know what I mean? If this was an yeah. issue, then we wouldn't have those. Yeah, we would have those trap hi-hats everywhere because they translate well to the, to the phone speaker. But what about the, the 808? Um, although it's all about the harmonic distortion and how you make it come through you know, how many harmonics you, you add to the 808 or a sine wave or something, so it will come through the, the phone speaker. This is something that I deal with a lot. So in that sense, but it makes a better mix because you need less energy if you if you use the, the missing fundamental effect um, to an extent and and you, you, you make sure that you have enough high kind of bass harmonics that will go through the, that, that will come through the, the phone speaker. Um, so it, it, in a way it's a, it's a sort of like a balancing, um, you just have to, to, to be aware of all the formats that your mix is going to be consumed on or with. Yeah. Um, you know, um, well, it's interesting isn't it? because it used to be uh, only whatever you'd listen to wax cylinders and a kind of trumpet, which had very little <laughs> frequency response. So everything sounded was pitched in the sort of voice territory, whereas now we have a much wider range. So I suppose it's, you know, yeah. It, and and you have um, the, the, the kind of spatial uh, element of it. So when you had stereo, systems you have you had to make sure that it's still compatible with mono because some people and now you have to to make sure that it's compatible with the phone um headphones earbuds is is a huge um kind of thing to consider um but yeah it's just one of those things whether specifically it had changed music I know that NS10s, the Yamaha NS10s that were the near fields of the 80s, together with DX7 changed music because you hear that sound. You you hear that sound until today, you know, it's kind of imprinted within the music. You hear the NS10s and obviously you hear the DX7. So I so I don't know if the phones have that kind of distinct effect, but um, I think maybe the codecs do because the com music that's much more complex and harmonically sort of stuff, you know, stuffed full. Like you know, there's too much stuff in it. MP3 can't can't really deal with it as well. So you end up with you know simpler input to make sure it doesn't get ruined so much. Yeah, on the final I wonder. It's not so much. I know that from my experience, I don't say, oh, let's take this, you know, high string part out because it won't 
you know, the MP3 codec will not deal with it or the Spotify, uh, you know, I don't think it goes to that, from my experience, it, it, it goes to, to that resolution. Um, but you do check it and you check it on Spotify and you check it on YouTube and, you know, uh, it's part of the mm, game now. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's interesting, guys, because, I mean, I suppose the thing is, you know, say you're working on a prog album, right? You're working on a crowd album. Your thought, thought processes might be less people are going to be listening to this in the park on the, on the phone over the speakers. I don't need to worry so much about that. Or do you still think about it when you're finally doing those mixes, I suppose would be a fair question. <laughs> uh, well, you want it to sound great. So whatever it is, um, I do think that mixes in general are a lot easier than they used to be, like considerably. I remember like mixing in the nineties and trying to get something that sounded good on different systems. I think it's probably because the different systems people had back then just didn't sound so good. I think like I, I, I would dispute that. I, uh, I I think a lot of people listen to mono these days. There's so many of these kind of smart speakers in most houses, which are often mono and or have some pseudo stereo effect. But there's lots and lots of mono, lots of mono listening. Uh, probably more mono listening now than there was, say, twenty years ago. Um, uh, so I don't know. I think it's a I think it's really interesting, but I, I, I typically find it might be because I'm more experienced and can make, uh, you know, uh, qualitative assessments, you know, quite fast that will translate well across different systems. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, yeah, it's an interesting point. I don't know. Um, with the passage of time, whether we'll be able to like listen back and go, oh, that sounds really 2013, that sounds really 2017, that sounds really 2021, you know, whether you can definitely do that in the 70s. I yeah, hear music. I, not, yeah, well, I suppose you, so. Yeah, that, there's that sort of squish. Yeah. The 80s can almost tell what year things come out in. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, and I'm always, that's something I'm always, I love hearing something that's older than I think it should be based on the production. That's always something that I get sort of thrills from. It's very nerdy, nerd, nerdy thrills. Um, but I think, I just don't know this day and age whether a lot of the things that were true in the past are true anymore. Um, and something that happened, I think, that's always quite interesting is when the rave and when when the rave music sort of revolution, and it was a revolution, hit in Britain in the late eighties, early nineties. You had a lot of people starting making. I say music. I don't know if some of it was music. Some of it, I think, was just kind of noise therapy for tailored for particular drugs. Um, <laughs> But uh, but a lot of those people who were making those things, those tunes, they didn't have any traditional uh, experience at all. So a any anything to do with what was right and wrong just went out the window. It was a new, that was a real paradigm shift in terms of. But they had um, a different. They had different monitoring systems, though, didn't they? So their their reference would be a massive, probably badly tuned or tur maybe turbo sound rigger at a rave, which had a completely <laughs> different sonic delivery pattern than. You know, uh, listening people, to something on the radio. But they were, you know. uh, but they were mixing on hi-fi speakers, a lot of that early techno yeah. rave stuff, That's hardcore true. house stuff, you know. Um, Mackie, Mackie, a, Mackie, uh, a Mackie desk and, yeah, well, it's a prodigy famous, a Mackie desk and the uh, and, and Mackie speakers or NS10s or whatever, yeah. I yeah, mean, we've Mackie, all... When they came out in the early 90s and the, also what else was there, those Alesis monitor ones and stuff, they, those... I see all I, that's what I'd see in people's kind of you know mm. like loads of people I knew were making rave music then sort of from early 90s onwards why am I mentioning this I'm going yeah. well off topic uh because it doesn't matter <laughs> things, <laughs> yes <laughs> things shifted this the whole kind of thing about mixing and placement and spatialization and you know and lots of the kind of you know all that stuff still exists of course but a new a new thing came out and I think modern ears are so accustomed to uh you know huge slab bases that you just would never have heard on earlier records you know just mm. ridiculous 
you know, huge slabs of sound. Um, and, you know, no dynamic range, everything really... <laughs> but people are just so used to it. Young people have only known it. So it's just, it's just so there's less re- and there's less room for other stuff. All right. Well, I, I think that's an intro. But I, time for one quick one more. This is a bit more of a light-hearted one. Perhaps so it might be a bit easier to answer because that was a that was pretty deep to be honest. But thank you very much for that question, David. Uh, let's just try this one and then we'll then we'll close. We'll wrap things up. This is from uh, Midi One Two Nine via YouTube. Oh, that's not it at all. Hello. Oh well. Uh, it will show up. Uh, uh, if you had to live with one drum machine for 2023, what would it be? And that's quite an interesting question. I, I, I might go first on that because I think I would go for... And it's not, I suppose it is a drum machine, but I would go for the Pulsar 23. And I think it's just purely because it's more of an instrument. It's, it, it's less traditional than, uh, than, than just a str- regular drum machine. And I'm not really, I don't really like pattern based stuff, but you could, uh, so uh, that, I mean, it's, it's more of a drum instrument. So it's a bit of a cheat. I don't know. Uh, Yoad, what would you go for? One drum machine. I haven't used a proper drum machine for, for ages. Um, I don't know if machine and uh, ni machine is um can be considered a drum machine if it is then i would use that because then i have it on the screen and i have you know everything and contact inside and but that's not really fair to, to call it a drum machine but i wouldn't even know to be honest right fair enough i think that's a fair a fair comment what about you guys i know you have a few favorites i i am <laughs> I'm craving a Percons, I think. The Erica Synth ah, Percons, okay. I think, it looks amazing. It's such a drum machine, drum, drum machine. You know, it doesn't try and be anything else. It's quite abrasive and it's uh, very performative uh, and looks fantastic. I, I like, I think the design choices that have gone into that, I think are brilliant. I love drum machines. Uh, I, you know, I've got, yeah, I think, you know, people are familiar that I'm really fond of the electron rhythm, um, because it's a do it all, but I'm also super fond of the combination of a beat step pro and the, the Vermona DRM as well. I love that. And, it, and those are poles apart. Those, those two, um, when yeah. I, but the perk looks like it's, You'd get results off of Percons that you wouldn't get anywhere else, I think. Um, I think that's a fair comment. I know Matt is absolutely in love with it because he reviewed it for us. In case you're wondering, you can see a review of it on uh, Sonic State elsewhere. But yeah, I I think you might agree there. I know Matt is is really enamoured by it. So uh, and it's because it's performance based, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing about it. It's very much geared around performance and the sort of limitations of itself. Yeah, they really have. Yeah, it's big. They, they <laughs> narrowed it down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all our listeners. Thank you to uh, all the folks in the chat room and the the various chats, the the, the YouTubes, the the Facebooks, the Twitch, and whatnot. Lovely to see you all, and uh, thank you very much. We'll be back next week. Uh, did I mention? I think I may have mentioned. We now have a date for our next EMOM, which is the eleventh of March. So that's coming up in about well, that's nearly eight weeks or so. Um, so yeah, we're we're going to be doing that. So um, more details will follow. We'll have that. I'm just trying to um, persuade some people to, to to take the headline spot, um, and uh, and then we will then we will we'll, we'll open open the gates for everybody else. But uh, thank you, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I, I guess you'll go back to your Atmos mix, and you've been listening to us in mono. So now your your head will be all over the place when you switch the speakers back Absolutely. on. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Here. You're welcome, and of course you'll be. Uh, Continue your good work at Waves and uh, all the other stuff, the music production, all the other things that you do. Uh, Thank you for joining us. And also, Gaz, thank you as well. Are you doing a show tonight, or did you say you were taking a bit of a break from that for a a while? I can't remember. Uh, uh, It will be coming back, not just yet, but yes, it will be coming back. I'm going to be doing something quite interesting, hopefully soon. I've been teasing this for a while. Ah, yes, you Uh, said there was a thing, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I would like to, though, just... Uh, promote the this gig on the 21st of January. It's a uh, EMOM in Froome. It's called Breeze Block Beats. I say it's EMOM. I'm not sure if they right, actually identify it as an EMOM event as such, but uh, uh, it's... Um, I'm just looking for where it is. 
Okay, I think it's in a farm. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, well, I've got a postcode for it. I'm looking for a link. I'm just trying to find a link. Uh, uh, a link. So if I post this, then there may be some information. If I yeah, post into okay, the, yes, then please. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, of course, um, Jamie, uh, Geosynth has got one in Blackpool, I believe, um, next Friday, uh, Friday the oh, 13th. Or the, is it? The yeah, so, oh, no, that'll be this Friday. It's a secret seller in the French general trading. <laughs> Secret seller in French okay. trade in, in in Froome. That's on the twenty first, um, and it's going to be the first time I'm going to play live under my bad workman name as well. Nice, you know. Well, I'm I, I'll, I'm going to try and get along to that. I will try and get along to that. I, I like can to blame my tools. Uh, I, I'm legitimate. <laughs> blame my tools with that name. You see. <laughs> Um, Lovely. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I know we probably should wrap things up now. I'm sure. I, well, I see Yoad's, Yoad's busy. He's got his getting a call. Uh, the more yeah, mixed tweets. The artist, Yoad, thank you very the much. The artist has uh, just arrived, so I'm going to say goodbye and uh, okay. get back to the session. Lovely. Well, that was it. That's Sonic Talk 742. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye now.